one. Thank you. Well, uh, welcome. Welcome to another overflow event here at the center. Um, and uh, thank you all for showing up early uh, and coming today for uh, the Journalist's Guide to Environment and Energy for 2018. I'm Megan Parker. I'm the senior writer editor here at the Wilson Center with the Environmental Change and Security Program. And the Wilson Center is thrilled to be partnering with the Society of Environmental Journalists for a remarkable sixth year in a row on this event. And I'm especially pleased this year because we will be launching the host, uh, we hosting, sorry, hosting the launch of the second edition of the Journalist Guide, which is SEJ's signature report. And copies of the overview are outside on the table. And the complete report, which includes 12 different sections looking at different uh, uh, issues, is available online at SEJ.org. The partnership with the uh, Society of Environmental Journalists is very important to the Wilson Center, and it's particularly important to me uh, as I serve as the associate board member for SEJ. And I'd like to thank all of my colleagues on the SEJ board, many of whom are here today, and I hope you all get a chance to talk to them uh, after the event at the reception. And a big thank you to our partners in our Managing Our Planet series, George Mason University, and especially Tom Lovejoy, who will be offering some closing remarks today uh, at the end of the event. And a quick word about where you're sitting. The Woodrow Wilson Center is the living formal memorial to President Woodrow Wilson, who is the only president with a PhD. And we are a nonpartisan forum for international affairs. And this month, we're very excited to be celebrating the 100th anniversary of Wilson's 14 points speech, which in January 1918 ended World War I and led to the League of Nations. Um, today, uh, we will begin with Jeff Burnside, who will present the Journalist's Guide. Jeff is a longtime SEJ board member and SEJ's immediate past president. He is a Scripps Journalism Fellow at the Center for Environmental Journalism at the University of Colorado. He is a nationally honored television news investigative reporter who spent most of his 20-year career at Como TV in Seattle and WTVJ Miami. After Jeff, Ed Maybach of George Mason University Center for Climate Change Communication will talk about his work to inform local climate reporting, including a new partnership just launched with SEJ and other uh, journalism organizations. And then after Ed, I'll invite Scott Tong of Marketplace's Sustainability Desk to come up, and he will introduce our all-star panel who is here today. And we'll have a roundtable discussion with those journalists, and then we'll open it up to you, the audience, for questions. When we get to the Q&A, please remember to wait for the microphone because we are webcasting live, so we want to make sure everybody watching can hear your question. Give your name and affiliation, and please ask a question, not a speech. <laughs> and, uh, and that's really important because we do want to hit 5 o'clock and go to our reception while you have a lot of time to meet with people and talk. And I want to very much thank all of the uh, supporters who made the reception possible today, all of whom are here uh, today. We have the Nature Conservancy uh, and the National Park Foundation, Environment America, the Wilderness Society, and the Environmental Law Institute. And all of them have a number of representatives here today who can tell you more about their programs as well as uh, materials outside. And I encourage you to learn more about their work uh, today while you're here. And thank you all very much again for attending. Jeff? Thank you, Megan, very much. So on behalf of the uh, Society of Environmental Journalists, the staff and the board and the board president, uh, we want to welcome you to the annual Society of Environmental Journalists 2018 Guide to Energy and the Environment. SEJ, if you don't know, is the, the world's leading such group of professional journalists and news reporters, uh, online, radio, TV, and yes, still lots of print newspaper folks. Uh, photographers, documentary filmmakers, academics, book authors, and students who cover all issues of energy and the environment. And if you don't already know SEJ, I invite you to check us out. Go to the website, SEJ.org, sniff around a little bit and find out more about us. I think you'll be happy to get to know us. Our signature event, uh, besides this forum in D.C., is our acclaimed annual conference that brings together the bulk of working journalists from across North America who cover these very issues all in one place at one time. It's an extraordinary convening. At one conference, I remember we had attendees from every U.S. state and 23 countries. 
So if you're a stakeholder in energy or environmental issues, you can't afford not to have a presence at our conference. It's where great conversations are taking place. And this year we'll convene at the University of Michigan in Flint, smack dab in the middle of one of the decade's biggest environmental stories. We'll examine, of course, not just water issues, but literally hundreds of other energy and environmental issues. And uh, the SEJ conference, I know for a fact, in October will be nothing short of riveting. So I invite you all to check us out on the website. Uh, Megan Parker, I want to thank you for once again putting this wonderful event together. You've been an extraordinary SEJ board member and a valued uh, friend as well. Thank you very much. <laughs> OK, so now I'm going to figure this out here. Is it this white button? Better show me before it's too late. The unmarked one, <laughs> of course. <laughs> I'm, I'm proud to unveil the 2018 SEJ Guide to Energy and the Environment. Um, we put together tips and tools on our website for, uh, for journalists across the country and really across North America, in many cases around the world. We have uh, links and supporting documents, contact information from sources from industry, NGOs, and government. I think there's even a few cell phones listed there for you. So we've made it really easy for reporters to, uh, to do their job even better. And I want to thank, us in particular for the guide, uh, SEJ staffer Joe Davis, who has done a spectacular job of not just researching these issues, but writing the summaries on our website. So really, we, enjoy, we invite you to go take a look on our website. And at, we'll use this brief overview here to, uh, to set up the, the scene for the incredible panel that we have to discuss some of these issues going forward in 2018. In fact, if you look around you, you'll see not just top journalists, but policymakers, um, NGO representatives, congressional staffers, scientists, academic, and, uh, and generally interested parties. So this convening is not actually just for journalists. We soon realized in our, these six years of doing this, but, um, but this, this is a gathering of people that will help set the agenda going forward uh, for these issues, and we invite you uh, to network. Every single year that SEJ and the Wilson Center are partnered to do this forum, we've been at over capacity. In fact, um, our overflow room is usually overflowing, so we apologize for everybody who couldn't get in here, and we welcome the thousands of you watching live online, and it will be archived as well. So let's begin with this unprecedented year, not just for the news business, but for America in general. Uh, the polarizing echo chamber uh, continues to be fueled by social media algorithms, of course. The attacks on journalism continue. Yet uh, one of the results is a greater awareness of the value of our craft in a free society. We do a terrific job of reporting the news, but as an industry, we don't speak with one voice, as it should be. Uh, so we don't do much to help people understand how to, identi how to identify real journalism, professional journalism. The Night Poll came out last week. I don't know if you saw it or not, but it wasn't pretty. It did say that when compared to internet news sources, Americans still have more trust in local and national newspapers and network TV news for accurate and politically balanced news. Americans, it said, still believe the news media have an important role to play in democracy, but they don't believe we're fulfilling that role fully. And perhaps it's because not everyone knows the difference between straight news reporters and, say, paid talking TV heads. The, the scream fests on cable television are not journalism. We ask a lot of news consumers to know the distinction. Some newspapers, too, can make it a little blurry when the word opinion or commentary is in little tiny letters on your cell phone when it pings you. So environmental journalism gets more and more important with every new person born into this world with every new ton of carbon emissions spewed out into the atmosphere, with every industrial impurity or toxin that finds its way into someone's bloodstream, maybe your neighbor's bloodstream, maybe your child's, maybe yours. So what we are facing is a big job for environmental journalists. We've whittled it down into 10 categories, natural disasters and what's next, energy and public lands, court cases to watch, scientific integrity, the clean power plan, it's not technically dead yet, but irrelevant perhaps, and what will it be replaced with? Scott Pruitt, Ozone and the EPA, more conflicts of interest among agency appointees, the, econo the economy will dictate markets, not solely policy, 
Ongoing official investigations will soon yield findings and how the midterm elections just might change everything. So allow me to kill the slides. <laughs> Where's our great guy? Natural disasters, magical. So will 2018 be as disastrous as 2017? It may be more likely than you imagine. Hurricanes, floods, wildfires, droughts, mudslides, heat waves, much more. Environmental journalists would do well to prepare because we believe more is on the way. NOAA and other expert sources say that 2017 cost a record $307 billion, to say nothing of the lives lost or the human misery of the survivors. The connection between extreme weather and climate change has been understood for some years, as the late, great Stephen Schneider told us. But what has changed in 2017, and really perhaps the last five years or so, is a, a greater understanding, precision, and level of confidence with which scientists can attribute climate change to some individual extreme weather events. It's based on quantitative estimates of probabilities. Climate change has also affects snowpack, which is, you know, is a huge driver of forest fires, wildfires. In his new book, Megafire, Michael Cota cites Forest Service data predicting wildfire acreage will double by mid-century from 2015. So 2018 is just simply one more step on that upward arc. Covering natural disasters is the ultimate global, national, regional, and local story for reporters, from the science of climate change to the city council vote on moving infra infrastructure. So it's our job to add context. Energy and public lands, supported by energy and mining and other resource extraction interests, President Trump campaigned on allowing these corporate interests to expand utilization of some of the hundreds of millions of acres owned by the American people. A plethora of stories here. Conservation, recreation, fishing, watershed, flood control, mining, logging, grazing, Native American interests, and of course drilling for oil and natural gas. Shrinking national monuments like Bears Ears. So controversy and news over the Interior Department's management of U.S. federal lands is a sure bet to continue in 2018, even if the arena for the issue likely shifts to the courts. In many cases, the agenda will be driven by the hunger of for-profit energy companies for low-priced taxpayer-owned coal and oil and minerals. Legacy of federal law allows mining companies to stake claims inside what was Bears Ears only one day after President Trump changed its designation, despite thousands of Native American archaeological and spiritual sites. So which mining company will move in first, and will there be a public backlash? 2018 will show whether Trump policies gain more traction in this area. And once again, we have a set of stories that are both national, regional, and local for reporters everywhere. The court cases to watch in 2018, some of those who are decrying President Trump's uh, actions on energy and the environment hope that the courts will slow or block or perhaps reverse some of these issues. Does the herbicide like glyphosate cause cancer? Do neonicotinoid pesticides harm bees? Will there be the next time bomb in DDT coming from somewhere that we don't know about yet? Certainly not all companies put profits over environmental health, but some do, and it's our job to find out. Covering science is hard enough for the trained science journalists working for dedicated science news media, but for general audience and non-specialist media, delivering the truth will be extra hard this year because there will be so much science involved. All reporters should be asking science coverage questions like, how do you know that? What's the evidence? Who agrees or disagrees? How big of a sample? How many studies? Who published them? Are they peer-reviewed? Are they statistically significant? What are the margins of error? Simple questions. In the SEJ Online Guide, we've, exploring, we've explored five likely key battlegrounds over scientific integrity to watch in this coming year. And they are science advisory committees, research budgets. Did I skip one? Let's sniff ahead here. Yeah, there we go. Uh, scientific advisory committees, research budgets, gutting the White House uh, Science Office, appointees with conflicts of interest and questionable relevant experience. Formal disclosures of conflicts of interest is required under most federal law, and agencies must generally give them to you if you FOIA them, but if they refuse, citing confidentiality, well then, that is a story too. 
By the way, SEJ has a very, very aggressive and robust FOIA task force. So if you're a reporter or a citizen, for that matter, that needs help with your Freedom of Information Ask uh, uh, questions, just contact SEJ. All the contact information is on our website. The Clean Power Plan is technically not dead yet, but it might as well be because it's irrelevant and won't be enforced. And what will it be replaced with? That's the big question now. Such a process might take years, but President Trump has insisted it be done by the end of this year, raising some questions about whether his attempt here is to be ahead of the midterm elections. The legal maneuvering will keep lawyers in business, of course, and will probably end up in the Supreme Court. Ozone, speaking of Pruitt and the EPA, uh, despite Pruitt's efforts to keep undisclosed the list of counties that violate ozone standards, remember before he was EPA administrator, he was Oklahoma's attorney general suing the EPA over this very issue, but good reporters can still find out, and we'll help with links on our site. Some newsrooms are already doing this. Is your city or county illegally smoggy? Ozone is serious because it can harm lung function and damage lung tissue, worsening bronchitis, emphysema, asthma, and on a legal level though, the, the, the being designated a non-attainment area triggers a set of corrective or some say punitive actions. Non-attainment areas have to come up with a plan of coming into attainment, and if they don't, the EPA is supposed to impose a plan. So reporters, how is your county doing? Let's get to some investigations. The Environment and Energy Beat may see a lot of news generated from various watchdog government agencies in 2018. Almost a dozen probes have been launched by uh, the Government Accountability Office, which is the nonpartisan arm of Congress, uh, and from uh, agency inspectors general. We can expect results of some of those investigations in 2018. At the EPA, Let me get to EPA first. Administrator Pruitt's frequent and expensive travel will be among the investigations, proving results, his meeting with the National Mining Association, Pruitt's purge of scientific advisory boards, his expensive soundproof phone booth, remember that one? His appearance in a beef industry advocacy video for a sitting cabinet member, uh, his use of a personal email account while Oklahoma Attorney General, and whether the EPA is violating President Trump's directive and order forbidding agency employees from participating in any manner on which they had lobbied the previous two years. Now, at, an, at Interior, we can look for results of formal investigations on Secretary Ryan Zinke's travel costs, his staff transfers under Zinke, prompted by one staffer who was reassigned away from his work on climate policy, Let's not forget about the large and, and questionable contract in Puerto Rico with Whitefish Electric. Uh, it was awarded to a two-person company with apparent links to Secretary Zinke. The midterm elections may change everything, and they are consequential this year for environment and energy policy. They could have drastically slowed down the deregulatory campaign of President Trump and the GOP, or even in some cases reverse it. We won't know until November, but before then, journalists can help frame these issues for the voters. Imagine just for a minute that uh, the party control changes in the House or the Senate or both. The legislative implications would be enormous here. And it must be said that a change like this in both parties would also bring within range impeachment of Donald Trump. Although Democratic and leadership currently downplays the idea, flipping House and Senate party leadership would change that, and impeachment could be more plausible if special counsel Robert Mueller unveils serious misconduct that warrants impeachment proceedings. Removal of Trump, of course, would not mean a change in the party in the White House, but it might, however, result in eventual changes in some of the more extreme pro-fossil fuel policies from the executive branch with impacts that could reach well into the future with issues like Anwar and Pebble Mine and even Paris. So moving forward in 2018, if you're on the energy and environment beat, or more likely if you're a general assignment reporter who just occasionally gets assigned to do an energy and environmental story, there is a robust dialogue coming in 2018. The 800-pound gorilla in the room, of course, is climate change. And a note to editors and news managers, coverage of climate change still suffers from incrementalism and the fear that, that it's boring for mainstream audiences. But journalism, as we're all taught, isn't about solely giving people what they want to know, but also what they need to know. So if you can't get behind that, then you may not be the journalist you think you are. And not to suggest that 
the news media is the only platform to, for discussion of these issues. I'm just back from the Sundance Film Festival where documentaries and films are all over the place about energy and environmental issues. And just announced last week, PBS will broadcast a sweeping series this fall called Native America, examining the Indian way so closely tied to the natural world. NGOs, some of you represented in this room, foundations, individual philanthropists across the spectrum will continue to expand their activities in 2018 on coal trains, on protection of wild places, land and sea, uh, saving iconic species from extinction, food, environmental health, much, much more, all big news in 2018. Science is lurching forward at breathtaking pace, and scientists, despite these political attacks, are doing important work and more and more no longer sitting quietly in the ivory tower because their findings are dire in some cases and compel many of them to speak. Conservative groups, even ultra-conservative groups, will continue to make inroads in this administration, and more and more companies from the regulated industries will seek opportunities and get them under this administration. Conversely, the sustainability revolution among private companies is growing exponentially. It's a vastly underreported topic. And sustainable technology will continue its explosion with the built environment, with transportation, with energy, and so much more. So fundamentally, all this translate, it all translates into a continuing discussion and greater awareness among everybody in society. And it's raising awareness, not taking a position, that is our job as journalists. The Society of Environmental Journalists will be helping journalists do that job even better, we hope, in 2018. Thank you very much. <laughs> now I get the honor and pleasure of introducing our next speaker. Ed Maybach is a professor and director of uh, George Mason University's Center for Climate Change Communication. For the past decade, Ed has been researching exclusively on the topic of studying public understanding of and engagement in climate change and developing and evaluating approaches to enhancing public understanding and public engagement. SCJ is pleased to partner with Mason's new climate change reporting project. Please give a round of applause for Ed Maybach. Ed. So I'd like to tell you a little story. Um, Happily, it is a good story. It's a, a nice story. We, we can all use more of those. Um, somewhat unexpectedly, it's a, a nice story about local climate reporting. Bet you didn't see that coming. Um, <laughs> bingo. And it, it is a story about local broadcast meteorologists, TV weathercasters. Um, it is a, there we go. Um, it is a story that was crafted intentionally um, to try to counteract this. Um, this is data that, that essentially makes the point that the average American sees climate change as a distant problem. They do see it as a problem. We do see it as a problem. But um, the average American sees it as a problem that is distant in space, somewhere else distant in time, at some point in the future, not today, um, and distant in species. It's, it's happening to plants, penguins, and polar bears. It's not really happening to me and my loved ones and people in my community. Um, and that's a problem. That's a problem because the reality is climate change is here and now. Um, national Climate Assessment, I served on the third National Climate Assessment released in 2014. That was really the, the key finding, that the climate change has moved from the future into the present. Um, its impacts are being felt in every community in America. And Americans who understand this are much more likely to be engaging in the issue, making better decisions, having clearer thoughts, um, and getting involved in, in bringing about solutions. Um, so we, in our research, our uh, Climate Change in the American Mind surveys, we've identified pretty early on that the public looks to TV weathercasters as a, a trustworthy source of information. Um, somebody that they would like to know what weathercasters think about climate change. Um, we decided this is really an important opportunity. Actually, this is Joe Witte. He used to be on the air here on the ABC station in Washington. Um, Joe Witte called me when he saw that that little factoid that he and his peers are trusted. And he came to my office and he said, okay, Ed, you've shown me we're trusted. What I can tell you is we have extraordinary access to the public. Like 
no one, nobody else in the climate community has. Um, we also have extraordinary communication skills. We get our jobs and we advance in our jobs because we take complicated information and we render it plain and engaging. Um, and ultimately, we are in the local news business. So we're talking about the things that Americans care most about. He said, why don't we work together to see whether or not we can make something of this opportunity? Um, we, Joe and I and Heidi Cullen from Climate Central, we wrote an NSF grant proposal to explore this opportunity. Um, we, the project had three components. We used what is called snowball sampling. We worked through Joe and his colleagues around the country who we knew were reporting on climate change. Um, and we interviewed them at length. As it turns out, although there are about 2,000 weather casters in America, we could only find 16 who were talking to their viewers about it. 16 out of 2000 and 2000, and the year being 2009. Um, the second component of our project is we surveyed all the weather casters we could identify. Um, and then the third and final component of the project is we wanted to actually test out the idea that if local broadcast meteorologists educate their viewers about climate change in their backyard, it would be a, a good thing. Um, sometimes you got to be careful what you ask for. We, the, the very first journalist to cover our survey findings of broadcast meteorologists was Leslie Kaufman, front page of the New York Times. First and only time my research has ever been on the front page of the Times. And it really wasn't the way I would have represented our findings. Um, our findings essentially showed that about half of weather casters understood that the climate was changing and would like to report on it. Most said they weren't, but they would like to. They just didn't know how. We learned from them in the survey what was holding them back. But the other half of the weathercaster community, not so clear on the facts. And in fact, at the bottom of the slide, you'll see that 26% um, said that the, agreed with the statement that global warming is a scam. So we, we essentially found a community of journalists, broadcast meteorologists, who were quite divided on this issue. But we also found Jim Gandy. He was actually one of the 16 who was taking efforts, making efforts to educate his viewers. He really wasn't doing it on air yet, but when we put out a call for a weathercaster who would work with us to become to really lean in on this issue, his hand shot up right away. He wasn't the only one. We actually had a weathercaster in Denver and another one in, in Detroit volunteer. But we decided, look, if we're going to do something risky, if we're going to do something hard, let's do it in a hard place. Let's not do it in an easy place. Uh, Detroit, we figured, uh, you, as you all know, this is an issue that it, we've got a sharp demarcation between the way liberals and conservative Americans see the issue. So we went to Columbia, South Carolina, where we knew we would be talking to conservative Americans. And Jim Gandy deserves enormous credit for having volunteered to go first. Um, what we did with Jim is we created a program that we call Climate Matters. Um, we essentially took NOAA data and we downscaled it. We ran only the data in the Columbia, South Carolina media market, showing the ways in which global climate change was coming home to roost already in Columbia in terms of changing weather patterns. Jim agreed to air 12 stories over the course of a year. He delivered on his promise. He aired a bonus. We got a baker's dozen out of him. Um, he was a fantastic partner. He was fearless. Mary Beth Jacoby, his news director, also absolutely fearless. Um, they were prepared for the worst. They knew it could go bad very quickly when um, they actually, we, we had long talks about this before they worked with us, and they said, this is really important. We think this is the right thing to do, and we're, we're willing to take bad consequences if, if they occur. They didn't occur. Um, we actually, Mary Beth loves to tell a story. They're still working with us today. They've gone from third in their news ratings to first in their news ratings over the course of the first few years in which Jim Gandy was the first person in Columbia talking about climate change on the air as a Columbia issue. Um, it didn't hurt them. It helped them in their, in their business. Um, but we also surveyed Jim's viewers, and we surveyed viewers of his competitor stations, both before the pilot test and again 12 months later. Um, so we surveyed a cohort of about uh, 900, I believe, 800. Um, and then we, at the end of the year, we also served an, uh, surveyed another cross-section of, of Columbia local news viewers. In both research designs, we showed the same effect. People who watched Jim 
learned more about climate change. It changed the way they see it so as to recognize it is more of a here and now concern. It isn't just somebody else's problem somewhere else in the future or, or that poor bedraggled polar bear that we see on the ice flow. So we knew we had something. Uh, first thing we did was we published it. Uh, we published it in BAMS, but once we did uh, jumped through that hoop, we really put our minds to what can we do to take this successful pilot test and scale it up so that we can develop resources that would allow, that would help other broadcast meteorologists around the country tell the same basic story, that climate change isn't somebody else's problem exclusively, it's our problem too. Um, with the, we, we went with the name Climate Matters. This was a name that Jim Gandy developed for his own coverage in Columbia, but it was such a perfect name we just decided, and with his permission, we just decided to run with it. So this is now a nationally branded program of localized reporting resources for broadcast meteorologists. Since 2010, when Climate Central and, and my team and NOAA and NASA, as our partners, when we began to scale this thing up nationwide, um, we went first from one reporter to in one market to 10 in 10 markets, and from there it just started to scale of its own accord. Uh, weathercasters were coming to us saying, I'd like to, to participate in this program. I'd like access to these materials. Every time we had a new media market, it created a new challenge. Our analysts at Climate Central had to run the localized data in yet another media market. But they were game, they were good, they got the job done. We never turned anybody away. Um, now we offer them these materials every single week. So we release a reporting package, a Climate Matters re uh, reporting package every week. We do it in, um, uh, we're currently in every media market in America. So any Local broadcast meteorologist who wants to participate can with localized data. We have the data, we have the story packages in English and Spanish. Um, I'll show you some of the materials in a moment, but that the materials are essentially broadcast quality graphics, um, animations, GIFs, more and more we're moving towards short videos, um, a, a variety of different materials that allow broadcast meteorologists to tell a local climate change story in whatever way they want and through whatever medium they want to tell it. So um, I just happened to be at the AMS annual meeting two weeks ago in um, Austin, so I have a bunch of Austin and, and Dallas uh, slides queued up, but this will give you a sense of the kind of materials that we produce. So in this case, 100-degree um, days are lasting further into the fall in Austin. Um, the heat, heat waves, days, periods of time over 95 degrees are um, becoming more prevalent in Austin, as with most of America. Um, fall days are becoming warmer. Um, we, with the increased heat, we get increased condensation and, and ultimately increased heavy downpours, which sounds like a good thing until, of course, you see the kind of damage that heavy downpours can bring. So it isn't really a good thing. Um, and of course, with hotter years, we get more fires, particularly in the West. So these are the kinds of reporting materials that broadcast meteorologists can use to tell a local climate story. Um, and it's not always bad news all the time. With warmer, with warmer uh, weather, we get more balmy football seasons, which means we get to enjoy cold beer more frequently. Um, here's the uptake. And this is the this is the part this is why I represent this as a happy story. So over the past five years, as we have scaled this up to a national program, we now have almost 500 weathercasters in America who are working with us. Um, that's almost one out of four weathercasters. Um, coverage on air coverage of climate change has increased by over 12 fold, 1225 percent. At, at last accounting that I have seen. It's a pretty remarkable uh, turn of events from a community who 2010 was completely divided on this issue and really could hardly have a civil conversation amongst themselves to a community who has recognized a reporting opportunity, an opportunity where they could be relevant and helpful to members of their community in understanding a risk that largely touches their lives through the weather, but not exclusively, and they, they really are amazing me in the way they have just taken to this and run with it. Um, we have 
so in addition to that first pilot test, um, we have additional data to suggest this is working. Um, this is data, this is a summary of data from a, 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 an experiment that we conducted in Chicago and Miami with Tammy Souza in Chicago and John Morales in Miami. Basically, I'll just summarize this by saying all of the ways that we were seeking to help people in Chicago and Miami understand that climate change is their problem, the, the data suggests that watching three short videos of Tammy and John talk producing or airing Climate Matters segments made exactly the kind of difference that we would hope as compared to them watching Tammy or John just do weather forecasts. Um, in our national um, public opinion surveys, the Climate Change in the American Mind surveys, over the past couple of years in particular, we have seen the secular trend, the trend line in public understanding and engagement in climate change, understanding that this is my problem We've seen a very distinct uptick in all of that, which is not, however, to say that we can take, we can attribute any of this to climate matters and the reporting by local TV weathercasters. We're still working on that. It turns out to be scientifically a much heavier lift than we understood when we, when we promised NSF we would take this on. But we, we, the trend is moving in the right direction, so the question that remains to be answered is, is the trend moving faster in media markets where we have more weathercasters working with us in the Climate Matters program? And that, that's the question we're trying to answer now. Um, the conclusion of this story is that um, because of the success of Climate Matters and our work with the broadcast meteorology community, SEJ, RTDNA, that's Radio, Television, Digital News Association, um, National, National Association of Hispanic Journalists, and National Association of Black Journalists have agreed to work with us in taking these localized reporting materials and our vast, ar vast and growing archive of materials, and they would like us to work with them to find ways of making these materials relevant and helpful to local journalists around the country who aren't broadcast meteorologists, and who do have unique, a variety of unique opportunities to tell local climate stories. So this is, uh, this is really the, the second, the, the follow-on story. It is, it is being written as we speak. I'm actually SEJ members who are here. If, you've, if you have responded to our survey, which is currently in your in in email inbox, I thank you for that, because that data is what we need to figure out how to make these materials most helpful to you. So um, with that, I will give the microphone back to Megan. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Ed, and, and I'd like to invite Scott Tong and, uh, and all of our panelists to come join us on stage now. While they're moving up here, I'd tell you a little bit more about our uh, supporters for the reception. Um, and give you a little bit more information on them so you can know what to talk to them about. The Nature Conservancy is dedicated to conserving the lands and waters on which all life depends. The National Park Foundation is celebrating 50 years as the official nonprofit partner to the National Park Service. Environment America is part of the public interest network and committed to a vision of a better world, a set of core values, and a strategic approach to getting things done. The Wilderness Society is the leading American conservation organization working to protect our nation's shared wild lands. And the Environmental Law Institute makes the law work for people, places, and the planet. And thank you all again. So now I'd like to introduce Scott Tong, and he will introduce uh, the other panelists. Uh, <coughs> and you also all have bios um, uh, in detail in the handouts. So Scott is a correspondent for Marketplace's Sustainability Desk, where he focuses on energy, environment, natural resources, and the global economy. Scott served as Marketplace China Bureau Chief from 2006 to 2010, and he has reported from more than a dozen countries. His new book, A Village With My Name, A Family History of China's Opening to the World, offers a long view of China's opening to the West, told through the lives of five people across five generations in his own family. And I urge you to check out that book. He presented it here at the center earlier this month, and it was great. So uh, th thank you, Scott. Uh, thank you, and thanks to the Wilson Center and SCJ for doing this. So my job is to move this along and keep it interactive with uh, panelists here and those of you there. And my other job is to be the jargon police. So, you know, it's fine if we hear an acronym. We'll just reach out and whack you on the head. So 
Um, uh, let me just introduce who's in front of you here, and then we'll talk a little bit and then open it up to two questions uh, from, from all of you. I'll start with Brady Dennis over there. He's national reporter with the Washington Post. Uh, he reports on environment and public health issues, and he was a finalist when he was reporting on the Economy Desk for the 2009 Pulitzer Prize on the global financial crisis. The full uh, bios are in front of you, and I'm, I'm just going to introduce our folks uh, quickly here. Matthew Daly um, is, has a large portfolio with the Associated Press. He has been covering Congress and energy, climate, environment, politics, and more. He's the former AP White House reporter and former chair of the Standing Committee of Correspondents on Capitol Hill. So thank you, Matthew. Nirmal Ghosh is next to me here. He is the uh, U.S. Bureau Chief for the Straits Times, the Singapore newspaper. Uh, he has been a foreign correspondent in a lot of places. He's been in the Philippines, in India, in Thailand. He wears another hat with his affiliation with the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. Uh, he works with local communities uh, in tiger and elephant reserves in India, and his fourth book has come out on, uh, on Thailand. So very <coughs> accomplished and thanks for joining us today. Pat Rizzuto is, uh, is, is down the table there and she has been reporting for with Bloomberg Environment on science and chemicals and the federal law that governs that, the Toxis Toxic Substances Control Act. Uh, thanks Pat for joining us here. Uh, Valerie is over there, nice to, nice to meet you. Valerie Volkovici is with Reuters. She's been reporting on environment and energy for the last six years or so here in Washington. She has reported on Congress and cap and trade, the Paris Climate Agreement, and she has reported overseas in Germany and China. Thanks for joining us. And Ariel is here. Ariel Wittenberg is with e, &E News, which is required reading for all of us here. Uh, she covers water issues there, which include wetlands regulations and infrastructure and drought. In the past, she has covered offshore wind and toxic waste issues. So um, what I'm going to do is I will, I will run a couple qu quick questions by each of you just <coughs> to kind of set the table and frame uh, the outlook for 2018, and then we're going to open it up to you after maybe 25 minutes or so and have <coughs> a lot of time for questions from, uh, from all of you. Uh, so I'll start uh, down there with you, Brady, um, from the Washington Post. You've written a lot about the EPA under President Trump. We're going to talk a lot about the EPA, of course, in this, in this session here. Um, carbon pollution and air emissions and water issues, toxic chemicals, toxic waste cleanup. Um, big broad question, I guess, in the absence of a lot of legislation on this topic, help us understand how an executive agency uh, can do so many things in such a short amount of time. Yeah, I, guess, I mean, I guess the glib answer to that is Scott Pruitt's uh, stamina and, and ambition are not <laughs> neither are small. Um, probably the more thorough answer to that is that, um, you know, executive agencies and the executive branch has a lot of power. And uh, Obama also had very little legislation that he was able to get through. And so he did a lot of the things that we now see being rolled back or scrapped through executive action. And if you go through about things that way, they can be undone the same way. And I think that's what we're seeing in the past year is this um, slow and in some cases not so slow unwinding of what had come uh, the previous eight years. Now, y you've reported on, on a lot of these. Give me an example of, you know, kind of what, what you're talking about. That is the, you know, from the administrator's office on down being able to understand this process and achieve, you know, what this administration is trying to do. Yeah, it's some of the things that we heard about earlier, the Clean Power Plan, the Waters of the United States rule. These are the big, uh, you know, headlines. But there are also any number of, uh, I don't I hesitate to say smaller, but less um, publicized, less um, uh, maybe significant actions. This can range from deciding to do buyouts that get rid of uh, hundreds of people or purging um, boards of scientific advisors uh, that is an executive action or saying that um, the administrator is going to be responsible for for uh, making the decisions on large Superfund cleanups or any number of things that um, can really change the shape and the ambition of an entire agency. So one looking forward question for 2018, can you give me one 
kind of example of one of these important regulatory fights that maybe some of us have not thought about? Oh, well, one. Hmm. Uh, well, I, one for now. I'm going to dodge the question a little bit, and I was reading one of Joe's uh, looks ahead, and I think he deemed uh, 2018 as yep. the year of confrontation. And I thought that was a good way to put it, because I think if you're a, a legal nerd, this is going to be your year. You know, there, mm. so many of these things are going to be tied up in the courts from the Clean Power Plan and others. Uh, I, I'm interested also in the things that don't make the biggest headlines and that, you know, maybe folks in this room are aware of, but others don't follow as closely, given both other news at the EPA, but also other news in the world that we're all consumed by these days. And, and it can be... Um, uh, uh, less, le lesser known regulations from, you know, certain kinds of trucks that, that pollute a lot and, and, and the rules on their emissions being rolled back, um, you know, to, it, to coal waste and how, how that's disposed of and the rules around that. And so I think it's important, uh, especially for journalists, to keep an eye on things like that that may fly below the radar because they have very real impacts uh, in communities around the country. Mm. Great, and I asked, I ran a few questions by all of you before this, and so many of you said it's just more important than ever to have sources inside these agencies to, sure. to help understand and kind of uh, uh, un understand some of what otherwise is kind of uh, opacity with these regulatory agencies. Pat, let me uh, uh, ask you a couple questions about chemicals. It's been almost two years now since uh, Congress uh, passed reform of the toxic chemicals law. Um, for those of us who, who always need to go back to square one, can you remind us what the <coughs> promise was? I and mean, this was a bipartisan, right? Uh, uh, many of the stakeholders all were in favor of this reform. What was the promise to, to the country of that reform, and where are we now? Well, in, in an area that's somewhat different from many of my colleagues up here, whereas they're watching policies be fundamentally altered, I'm watching policies regarding chemicals be developed. Um, in 2016, all sides, as, as Scott just said, came together for a variety of reasons and agreed almost unanimously to overhaul a 40-year-old law called the Tops Toxic Substances Control Act. It governs chemicals in commerce. And the reason they all came together was because there was pretty widespread agreement the old law simply wasn't working. It had allowed tens of thousands of chemicals to enter the market with no one looking at them to evaluate their safety. Yes, companies had done their own pre-market testing, but the U.S. is not a country that easily accepts the phrase, trust me, I did the research. So there wasn't an, any kind of independent oversight because the original law never required EPA to look at chemicals in commerce. And so that was a major focus of, of this reform effort was to absolutely tell EPA you must look at chemicals in commerce and to unshackle EPA's hands and to make it a lot easier to get information and to make very clear lines about what information could be kept secret by the EPA to protect the company's legitimate proprietary interest and what information had to be available to the public because it too has an interest in its own health and safety. So that was the promise. We're mm -hmm. going to do something better that's going to give you confidence in chemicals. And the promise to industry was that because we're going to make something that builds more confidence, you'll have fewer states regulating chemicals. You'll have fewer retail regulations, fewer Walmarts, Targets, Home Depot telling you what chemicals must be in the products they'll sell. Um, so that was the promise, and they were worked very hard. Uh, and EPA has been incredibly diligent about meeting all of its statutory deadlines since the law was passed. Um, and the verdict is out in a lot of areas. However, in a year and a half that the law's been being implemented, there are some preliminary decisions it's made, and all of those are very, very controversial, uh, whereas all parties came together to get the law overhauled. All parties are back in their corners with their boxing gloves on, and just like my colleague was saying, um, it's going to be fought out in the courts, and there are already four major court cases to be tracked. So, so let me just 
uh, ask you uh, going forward, and this may not be a 2018 question, I mean, this takes time, is what to you will be an indication that, um, th that, that the public will have more confidence? It sounds like a lot of uh, what this complex process about is about is chemicals that are already in the world today. Well, I think if you see fewer states regulating chemicals, if you see fewer demands for retail policies, that would be one marker. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, Valerie of Reuters, uh, I'm going to talk to you a little about coal. You, you <laughs> have written about coal and public lands and fossil fuel development. Uh, the president, as we know, says he has delivered for the coal industry. Uh, he's, he said West Virginia is doing fantastically well. We have some metrics of production being up over over last year, and some states where coal mining jobs have, have grown. So uh, to what degree have we seen a recovery in the coal sector? Right. So obviously, as I'm sure you've heard many, many times, uh, President Trump was <coughs> going to revive the coal industry around the country. And um, we've seen him with his uh, hard hat on and, um, and speaking to coal miners at rallies. Um, so while he's done a lot to, of, of deregulation um, for regulations that do target the coal industry, what has that really translated into? Um, overall, last year we, we saw some uh, data from um, the Mine, Self, Mine Safety Health Administration. And uh, so overall there was an increase across the country of 771 jobs uh, in the coal sector. And that is an increase, and a lot of that increase was in West Virginia, mm -hmm. uh, Virginia, and Pennsylvania. So these were some of the kind of iconic states for, for President Trump. Um, so there was a little bit of good news there. It might have, in a way, kind of psychologically been a boost. But what was interesting about that data is across the country, there were declines in, jo in coal jobs, you know, almost everywhere else in the West uh, in particular. So. The story is not necessarily a great one. I mean, there was an increase, but it's increasing from a very low level. Um, and at the same time, for example, in Pennsylvania, when there was an addition of jobs, there's just been an announcement of a big mine closure. So the question is, you know, in order to help coal country, what is President Trump doing in the long term? I think part of that answer has to do with accepting the fact that a rebound is never going to be huge and focusing oh. on what it will take to boost the economies of, of those places and diversify those economies. And that's been tricky because I think the psychological impact of, you know, this small boost in jobs and this focus, this really heavy focus on uh, reviving, you know, and supporting the coal industry is giving people a little bit of hope that things are getting better. But over the long term, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done that I think some states were taking steps towards doing. and are now maybe not focusing on that. When you say the rebound is <coughs> not going to be huge, why do you say that? Well, the, the market, uh, natural gas continues to, you know, we're going to see a huge uh, shift. Uh, we're going to see some closures of coal plants, and they're going to shift to natural gas. Um, that's not going to stop. Uh, and I think a lot of the this, this little rebound we've seen has been driven by exports of coal to uh, well, to China and to Europe, and that's going to be very volatile. That's not going to be consistent. Um, that depends on global market factors. So you can't count on this full comeback, and I think a lot of states acknowledge this for years but maybe have cast some of that um, reality aside for this kind of brief kind of good news period. And, and just before moving on, let me ask you about the uh, – uh, you know, there are certain benefits for certain sectors, uh, this deregulatory push. Let me ask you about the, the cost. I don't know if you've been able to go to some of these communities where, where the people have, where you've seen the, the cost of this deregulatory push. Do you have any examples of uh, places you've been or illustrations of w one year into this administration, how, uh, ha what's how that side of the picture looks? Um, let's see. Well, Here's, I mean, this is the, the cost of the maybe the, I mean, the focus on deregulation. I mean, the deregulation has been, I, I think, received in some kind of coal communities as, as very good news. Uh, I was out in southwestern Pennsylvania in one community uh, where, you know, people were really, you know, they were saying to me, like, oh, we're so happy the EPA has finally gotten off our back. 
Um, at the same time, you had the local officials really um, desperate to try to attract other kinds of businesses because they were kind of getting really uh, exasperated with every, every couple of months seeing kind of these you know, layoffs of hundreds at a time and then having to figure out what to do with people. So um, I think this kind of sense of relief <coughs> was keeping them from retraining in other areas. Uh, and, and that is ultimately perhaps uh, deterring companies from coming in because they see this as solely a coal community. And Thank you. Uh, uh, Matthew, let me go to you. Matthew Daly of the Associated Press. You have been covering offshore drilling in the Interior Department. Um, uh, let me start by asking you about the Interior Secretary. Uh, you know, in a note beforehand, you, you, you wrote about how that is helpful to kind of understanding what, what, what motivates him. So in your reporting, what can you tell us about uh, <coughs> uh, what, what motivates the Secretary and how that perhaps uh, helps us to understand what he's trying to do? Well, I would say that, you know, just as uh, Brady was saying that, you know, Scott Pruitt doesn't lack for ambition and ego, I would definitely say Ryan Zinke does not lack for either ambition or ego, and he is very much, <coughs> excuse me, wants to be Trump's favorite guy. He wants to be the guy that Trump looks to, who's kind of pushing his agenda, just most recently on the government shutdown. They made a very big push to not close down the veterans, uh, the World War II Memorial in Washington. He went out there that first mm -hmm. day. He was tweeting about it. Uh, because during the previous shutdown in 2013, Obama administration did shut it down, and there was these pictures of veterans trying to get to the World War II memorial. And he is on message. He's, that's one thing you could say about Ryan Zinke. He's on message, but not always. I mean, he when he did the offshore drilling plan, basically what that plan would do was open it up to 90 percent of offshore waters in the United States would be open for drilling, which is a huge increase. And that includes California, where they haven't had drilling in you know 40 years. It includes Florida, where it's basically an article of faith among politicians in Florida to not drill there. And so a few days after he made the announcement, he went down to Tallahassee, had a quick little meeting with uh, the governor there, who happens to be running for Senate, and said, oh, I've changed my mind now. And it was kind of a strange little moment where he basically gave the impression that after a 15-minute meeting at, at the airport in Tallahassee, that he had changed his mind. And so now there's all the other states are saying, what about us? You know, South Carolina, Massachusetts, Maryland, you know, there's all of these states are saying, we don't want drilling either. Why, why can't we get an exemption? Um, uh, and and uh, let me ask you about the, the proposed, we've read about this reorganization that, that could be coming to, to the Interior Department. Tell us a little bit about that going forward and, and why that is important. Well, you know, Ryan Zinke likes to remind audiences that he is a former Navy SEAL. He pretty much says that multiple times a day, every day. And he likes to say that he likes to get his generals out in the field. And so he wants to move some of these agencies that deal with Western lands. I mean, the Bureau of Land Management mainly deals with the West. Bureau of Reclamation deals with the West. He wants to push their headquarters out to some unspecified place, perhaps Denver. We're not sure where they're actually the headquarters would be although he would have to get Congress to approve it. And th these reorganizations have come up before, mm -hmm. and Congress has always said no. Uh, but his basic idea is that why should we be here in Washington, D.C., you know, land of the swamp? Again, he uses the Trump language. We want to push our people out to the country where, you know, it's, 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 they're closer to the decision makers. And that's sort of the same idea with the drilling. He's basically trying to say, you know, we will listen to the states, but we're just not, we're not going to do anything without talking to the states, which some of the states have really appreciated that because I think there is a lot of resentment out in the West. I mean, look at the Bundy thing. I mean, there's, there's a lot of resentment within, in the West of the federal government, what they consider overreach. I mean, you could get into a big argument of whether or not it's overreach, but that's, you know, he's taking this one side on that. Great, thank you. Uh, Ariel Wittenberg at E&E &E News. Uh, let's talk a little about water issues. Uh, it's been just a couple days since the Supreme Court uh, ruling on the waters of the U.S. regulation, you know, and which bodies are subject to federal oversight. Um, for those of us who always have to start over, um, it remind us of what the rule says and what the latest ruling means. Right. So um, the Supreme Court ruling was actually about court jurisdiction. Of there have been these lawsuits in district and in court and in the Court of Appeals over this Obama era regulation, and the Supreme Court said that all should be in district court, not in the circuit courts of appeals, which is 
important to the actual content of this rule, which I'll get to in just a second, because um, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals is the court that issued a nationwide stay of this regulation. Mm -hmm. So it's never gone into effect nationwide. It went into effect in a handful of states for a, a matter of a couple months, um, never really enforced. And, and that is potentially all about to change unless the folks suing it about this rule can convince a district court to also issue a nationwide stay. Going back to the question of what this rule actually is, um, basically, as you said, it's the definition of what water is or wetlands is protected by the Clean Water Act. All the Clean Water Act tells you is that it should apply to navigable waters of the U.S., and that phrase is defined as waters of the U.S., <laughs> which is not very helpful. Um, <laughs> so essentially since 1972, when the Clean Water Act was passed, there's been this ongoing effort to define what that really means. Um, the Obama administration came out with this regulation in 2015 in response to another Supreme Court case. Um, and so they essentially based their regulation on the opinion of Justice Kennedy. And he says that water should be protected by the Clean Water Act if they have a biological, chemical, or hydrologic connection to larger navigable waters. So this is a question of, okay, if the Chesapeake Bay, definitely that's a federal interstate water, how far up into its tributary system, into the wetlands of the tributary systems, how much of that should the EPA be regulating versus the Maryland Department of Environmental Quality? So um, that regulation, folks in the ag industry, folks in the energy industries, housing development industries said this is a huge amount of government overreach. You're regulating these wetlands and small waterways that we've never had to deal with, EPA or Army Corps, on filed lawsuits. So th that is, the Supreme Court just said, all those mm -hmm. lawsuits have to be handled in district court. To add one more <laughs> layer of complexity here, <laughs> um, the Trump administration has said that they're gonna repeal this regulation. Mm -hmm. Um, and not just repeal it, they want to replace it with um, a regulation based on the opinion of Justice Scalia, who in th that same case where Kennedy ruled, basically said waters of the U.S. should just be relatively permanent water. So much more, if you look at it, it looks wet, that, that should be it. It doesn't matter as much if there's a groundwater connection or if the salamander you know, in, in the wetland that there isn't a groundwater connection lit also, you know, spawns in the stream or, or things like that. He, he's just interested in the presence of water. Okay, and, and but as Brady was explaining, if you're trying to, to change a regulation, you have to go through all the same steps as if you were uh, 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 writing a new regulation in the first place. Is that right? Yes, you do. Yep. Um, and there there is a little bit of, this will be an interesting test because they are, they're doing repeal and replace in two parts and there have been questions about the legal defensibility of the ways in which they're trying to do this repeal of the clean water rule. Um, the Trump administration did not include any kind of arguments about why the science that the rule was based on wouldn't be accurate or why you shouldn't be using Justice Kennedy's opinion, why you should be using Justice Scalia. So whenever they, they actually get around to repealing this rule, that will also end up in district court. Very quickly, I just want to ask you um, uh, about the, there's a war on lead that <laughs> Scott Pruitt okay. has, has vowed for this coming year. Just briefly, wh wh what does that mean? Right, um, so Scott Pruitt has set, told Congress a couple months ago he wants to do a war on lead. Um, that's lead paint, but it's also lead in drinking water, which obviously the nation has been very acutely aware of, at least in the past couple of years because of Flint, Michigan. Um, EPA has actually been supposed to revamp its lead and water regulation since 2010 and hadn't really gotten around to it. The Obama EPA was on track to put out that new regulation in June. That was delayed. Now, tr now Pruitt is saying, we're, ge we're getting to that this year. That's 2018, war on lead. Um, but there's a question mark of what that is actually going to include and a lot of public health advocates who are not, not necessarily partisan on these issues are getting nervous. They've seen how um, the EPA has looked at other toxics issues and are worried, well, maybe 
don't touch it because we're w they're worried that he won't do enough or he might roll it back. Great, thank you. Uh, and finally, Nirmal, uh, thanks for, for joining us. I, I wanna, you have reported on a lot of global environmental issues that relate to globalization, illegal wildlife trade, oil and gas exploration. You have said that that these kinds of conflicts with regard to kind of economic globalization and wildlife issues, that these conflicts are rising. Can you give me an example or two of what you mean? Well, <coughs> coincidentally, <coughs> just before coming here, I read up that uh, a new study which has come out, uh, it was done by the uh, Senckenberg Biodiversity and Climate Research Center in Germany on mammal movements, and they found that on average, mammals living in human modified habitats move two to three times less far than their counterparts in areas untouched by humans, mm. right? Okay, so that sets a bigger picture. Um, if you look at a place where I've worked in Southeast Asia and South Asia, you, the most egregious example of human wildlife conflict is, is elephants. And we're not talking about just one country, we're talking about a half dozen countries in from South China all the way down to uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, just to give you one statistic um, in, um, in one year in India, at least 400 people are killed by elephants, and 100 elephants are killed in human elephant conflict alone. And this is not, this is disregarding crop damage, which amounts to millions of dollars, right? And uh, things like this um, also raise ethical issues, uh, just as, uh, you know, palm oil uh, is an issue because of the orangutans, right? Uh, you have the ethical issue of, um, Elephants in tea gardens. Is, uh, what sort of practice does, does do the tea gardens uh, uh, indulge in with you know with regard to elephants and uh, coffee plantations as well in Sri Lanka? So you have this uh, this conflict, which is just getting worse. Essentially, it's getting worse, and you have uh, examples of this. Uh, this this um, research in Germany was uh, global research. So this is all over the world, and um, in uh, in the U.S. as well. You have conflict, of course, with you know mountain lions, bears, and wolves and ranchers, of course, right? Um, but the thing is that it's not all bad news. There's also good news. Uh, there are good uh, stories of coexistence if you look for them. For example, in uh, the uh, town called Akole in Western India, a town of 20,000 people. You know, 20,000 people in India is a small town, right? <laughs> so um, there was a female leopard which who lived in a colleague among 20,000 people for an entire year, <laughs> basically undetected, except for one incident in which some a cyclist spotted her. So she lived on stray dogs and you know, pigs and whatnot for an entire year. She was GPS collared, so they could figure oh. it out. None of those 20,000 people in a densely populated area knew she was there. Similarly, you have um, uh, mountain lions in places like California and Montana living in built up areas undetected. So th there's a lot of hype about uh, the threat of wildlife mm -hmm. in urban habitats. We're gonna have to relearn how to live with uh, small and large predators in uh, urban habitats, um, in, in North America, in Asia, in parts of Europe as well, where there's coyotes in, in urban habitats in, uh, in North America or foxes in, uh, in, in England, and they're thinking of reintroducing uh, the, I think the, uh, uh, the lynx as well. So, you know, we have, we have to learn these things, and, and these are going to be stories because at the end of the day, if you, um, uh, if you live in Montana and you have a mountain lion in your backyard, you are no different at that moment from a person <coughs> who's living in, in Mumbai and has a leopard in his front yard, right? I mean, it's, it, these are all human stories mm -hmm. which everyone can identify with. Maybe not with <coughs> elephants, but I just mentioned the elephants because it's a huge issue. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, the media is dominated by stories of African elephants for with good reason, but the Asian elephant is somewhat neglected and it, it is actually in, in possibly greater crisis. Mm. Yeah. And, and I wanna kind of shift gears and ask you uh, just a brief uh, climate question. You've been reporting in, in, in a lot of the world. We heard from uh, Ed, Ed May Maybach earlier today about uh, uh, right, we weather casters having to uh, have a certain amount of credibility to be able to to talk about uh, the science and trying to find trusted voices to to explain this. So here in the U.S., uh, we're having a version of a of a climate climate change conversation. I just want to understand y your perspective. Uh, for you know, who who spent a lot of years outside the U.S. When you kind of parachute into this climate conversation, what do you make of it? Uh, it's disconcerting to see the sort of uh, anti-science. Uh, uh, groundswell 
in some respects and um, the devaluation of the climate debate. Uh, from my experience in uh, South, Asia, South Asia and Southeast Asia, I mean, these are huge, as, as we know, I mean, uh, global warming is a huge force and uh, uh, especially in terms of mountain habitats, maritime habitats, these densely populated cities on coastlines which are sinking and because of overbuilding, much like Houston actually, there are so many parallels which are rarely drawn by the media, but there's so many parallels. Uh, huge overbuilt cities on coastlines and in river deltas which are sinking and then subjected to rising tides and uh, storm surges and whatnot. And uh, you have um, problems in the mountains, in the Himalayas specifically, the third pole, so to speak. That, that's where water comes in. Um, uh, the added to that, you have human modification of the landscape. For example, China and Laos building dams is modifying the entire Mekong River system landscape. And we're talking about you know, hundreds of millions of people depend on that. Fish as well, it's the richest fishery in the, uh, on the planet. And this landscape is being changed at a really rapid pace. Uh, it, in within five years, we're going to see huge changes. And it, this gets a lot of attention in Asia Pacific media, but not so much in global media. Mm. Great, uh, so I'm gonna open it up uh, in a second, so get your questions ready. Uh, earlier in the day, I asked folks to, to tweet in any questions they had for our panel. Got two. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to ask those two. <laughs> and then, uh, and then <coughs> be ready to, to raise your hand. So we're gonna we're gonna take two questions at a time for this this panel in general. And so where you want to jump in, uh, just go ahead and do so. So so one question. Maybe I can identify the the source of this. Um, will in Seattle or will Seattle? This question is, can we quadruple renewables by 2020, or is that not enough? So that's one question on the economics of renewable energy, uh, if anyone wants to take that on. The other question from another uh, person on Twitter is, what are the U.S. national options for meaningful contributions on climate change in the Trump era? U.S. national options for meaningful contributions. Go ahead and raise your hand, and we'll we'll go to you. I'll take a stab at the second, which I don't know if uh, if the person who tweeted means what can the country. What did you take that to mean? What can the uh, I think national level, right? National level contributions to control controlling reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah, I mean, right now not much. <laughs> you know, I think the place to look for that uh, domestically is states and cities who. Uh, you know, states like California and Washington and others who have stepped forward and said, uh, we're going to try to fill the void left by the um, um, lack of leadership on this issue uh, under President Trump and try to live up to the, uh, to the U.S.'s pledges that it made under the Paris Agreement. I don't think there's any um, sense that, uh, that states and localities could actually make up that difference on their own, but um, I think it won't be for lack of trying in some places in the coming years. I Great. think uh, the private. Valerie. Sorry, I, I think the private sector can also play a role. I mean, in addition to the states and cities who uh, have made a really public showing that they're going to continue the Paris goals, there were quite a lot of companies who were uh, quite eager to kind of jump on that bandwagon, and you know their investments, uh, their supply chains can all affect have a significant effect on. Um, on climate change, and um, and again, we've seen it under the Bush administration before. Uh, there was a lot of engagement in the global space, but uh, shareholder pressure um, on some of the, the the big financial institutions and investor institutions. I think that will continue, and we've been seeing it with the pipelines, with Dakota Access, and probably see it again with Keystone Pipeline. But uh, we might see some shareholder activists get involved. Okay. Anyone else? Well, I think industry has also said that they want to, on methane in particular, they want to have you know a little bit tighter standards, and that's something that you know is kind of unusual because at the same time, the Trump administration is actually getting rid of this uh, methane rule for fracking, mm -hmm. so that's kind of uh, 
they go in opposite directions. So the industry has been saying, listen, as we've increased our drilling for natural gas over the last you know, decade, basically, the uh, methane has gone down because of the improvements in the techniques. So you can argue you know, some of this stuff is proceeding even with, that, with the hostility of the Trump administration also there. And, and, and you mean uh, emissions of the greenhouse gas methane through, through all the stages, through the drilling, yeah. the fracking, the yeah. transport, the storage, uh, and, and you know, there's still a lot of it. questions about whether how how far that will really go and how far I industry will take it on a voluntary level. Mm -hmm. But they certainly have talked about that the emissions are down based on the improved technology. Great. Anyone else? Okay, so uh, we're going to have uh, wait for the mic, please. We're going to have uh, one on this side and one on that side, so I'll take you, sir, in the glasses uh, <coughs> here if you can wait for your microphone, and you, sir, in the glasses there, and, uh, and we'll have you ask uh, two questions, uh, one each. Adam Siegel, I blog at Get Energy Smart Now. A, a question, if when we look at what's going on, especially in the Democratic side, we have scientists, quite a few scientists, 314 action, recruiting people. We also, when you start to look around, I think climate science is showing up on far more of the websites with the candidates than we might have seen in previous elections. I'd be interested in within your institutions, do you see this as an environmental story? Is it a political story? Do the political reporters talk to you, interact? How is that being treated within your institutions? Thank you. Uh, you started a question, right? Yeah, go ahead, please. Hi, uh, my name is John Rumpler. I'm Clean Water Program Director for Environment America. We're pleased to uh, be a sponsor here today. And Scott, let me just say, uh, my wife is a wild fan of Marketplace. Uh, if Ryan Zinke, as a Navy SEAL, thinks he's got anything over on Kai Rizdahl as a former <laughs> Navy pilot, uh, Harold Rumpler strongly We'll call her at Pledge Week. Thank you. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, believe me, she's on there. Um, but actually, my question is as, as for Ariel, of course, on clean water. Um, I was really struck by uh, Ed Maybach's um, presentation about what will it take to convey powerfully to the public what climate means for our daily lives. And I'm just wondering, Ariel, um, what, what do you think can be done similarly on issues of clean water to ensure that the impacts of um, policies that seem obscure, like the jurisdiction of the Clean Water Act, are actually driven home in ways that allow people to realize that what does that mean for my drinking water? What does that mean for the health of the Chesapeake Bay where I go swimming or fishing and so forth? Okay, so uh, a question on on uh, uh, clean water and how to kind of drive that home to, uh, to help us understand a and covering uh, climate science and candidates and what, what kind of a story that is. Well, I guess I'll, ahead, I'll take Ariel. the water question. <laughs> um, that has been my mission. <laughs> I kind of have been wearing two hats. One is the administrative law professor, <laughs> um, sort of writing about all of these kind of incremental legal battles going on. But, you know, I, I do think it's really important to say, okay, we're talking about this issue at such a high altitude, it almost seems theoretical to go out and find where are the, the actual places where this matters. And if you have any ideas, email me. Um, <laughs> but uh, just as an example, I did an article about uh, Pocosin wetlands in North Carolina, um, which were covered by the clean water, would have been covered by the clean water rule, had been covered um, under guidance the Bush administration had, and would almost certainly not be covered by whatever regulation the Trump administration comes up with. They obviously haven't written that yet. Um, but they've said that they want to follow in Scalia's footsteps, so we have a, a pretty good idea of where they might be headed. Um, and, and these are wetlands that, on the state side, have also had varying levels of regulations over the years, and when they weren't regulated in the state and when they weren't regulated federally, um, there was a collapse of the nearby brown shrimp fishery that many people um, credited with the draining of these Pocosin for agriculture. Um, so that's just one example of you know, if you can find an example of that in your locality to, to personalize, <coughs> you know, Pocosins are great habitat for black bears. They're one of the only remaining habitat for black bears in the eastern United States. So if you can find a way to, to personalize that and bring it down or, you know, examples. Also, on the flip side of that, of course, is the examples of the farmers or developers who have been, you know, targeted or prosecuted by administrations for filling in those kinds of wetlands, I think. Great. Uh, any thoughts on the uh, political candidate and, and climate question? 
I'll take a brief crack at that and just say that uh, this is not specifically um, speaking to elections, although I, I talk with some regularity to our political and White House reporters about um, uh, climate environment policies coming out of the White House or the EPA, or, or they give us a heads up on things they're hearing. Um, and they certainly recognize uh, when there's a big story like, uh, you know, withdrawal from the, the announcement to withdraw from the Paris Agreement. Um, I think when it comes to uh, the day-to-day -day coverage of that out of, um, in the politics arena, or especially with the elections, uh, I'm a little uh, perplexed at how we raise that issue when you have so much attention on you know, Russia or immigration or health care or, uh, I mean, just look what the Alabama Senate race turned into. So I, I, I'd be interested in talking after <laughs> with anybody who has good ideas of how to elevate that or, or um, if you've seen places where that is going to become a top level issue in the, in the elections, at least this year, because I just haven't seen it. Great. And, well, and if oh, I could yeah, add in, um, we do have a reporter who's pegged that as one of the areas that she's going to be covering to identify key races, you know, um, spots that are vital in seats that are vital in the House and the Senate where environmental issues are also arising as part of the um, candidates discussions and she's working with the correspondents in those areas um, to who, who are helping bring her attention to you know, this environmental he issue here like in North Carolina with the Gen X spill um, it, which is a spill of a chemical of concern into local waterways um, that's being affecting this local race. And so it, we're trying to do it from the ground up and down. And I would just add briefly on in, at, in the Capitol that there's a greater number of Republicans who have joined a climate caucus. That that's kind of been interesting in the last you know few months. That's led by uh, Carlos Corbello of Florida. And there's just the idea that House Republicans are actually talking about climate change and saying that they believe in it and want to do something about it is Almost shocking, but it's it, which is shocking that it's shocking. But I mean, it is happening. Well, what is the caucus up to now? It, well, just Allie? Um, I think there's like more than 25 now, so okay. which is which is you know, hmm? yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's 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 you know, it is growing, which uh -huh. is I think a phenomenon that we maybe should be writing on more because I think the general perception has been that Republicans just don't want to talk about it and and they aren't interested in it. And I think that that's not always true, and certainly not now. Great. Okay, I'll start uh, uh, over here with, with Frank, and then uh, on this side, you, sir, with the glasses. So first, and then wait for the mic, please. Frank. Hi, uh, Frank Masano with Bracewell. Thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. Uh, we love SCJ, and thanks to SCJ for <coughs> holding this event annually. Um, I've been doing this for 20 years, or plus 20 years, as you all know, and I've been waiting still for the election to really matter or this to come down to the elections so we'll see I don't think this year is different even when Tom Steyer threw millions and millions into it it still didn't matter so um, my question is on the interaction between all these issues we have shale gas has exploded that means there's more natural gas available which means we've been able to go away from coal which has allowed utilities to become more accepting of renewables and then of course President Trump slaps a tariff on solar and, um, you know, offshore wind is starting and stopping and starting and stopping. And, you know, hopefully New York will, will blossom with stout oil in the leases over there. My question is the interaction between all these things. H where are the unintended consequences? Where are the pitfalls? Um, and do the battles that we see regularly that you guys are riding on, environmentalists suing, industry pushing back, do they slow these things down, or do you think they speed them up? Do you think there are ways? Well, just to clarify, uh, when you say slow, slow these things or speed these things up, w w what are these things? Well, like development of renewables or, you know, for instance, the pipeline challenges that we okay. see. Okay, okay. Thanks, Frank. Please. Hi, I'm, I'm Roger, Wither Roger Witherspoon. I'm on the board of SEJ. I'm curious, with the administration's efforts to boost nuclear power and where do you see that going since their last effort was slapped down by FERC and while it's 
easy to say I'm going to cut regulations. How do you really do that in the nuclear industry without gutting all of the safety requirements? Okay. Uh, anyway. well, well, just to take the second question first, I think that that was kind of a surprise, that decision by FERC that, uh, you know, they, they basically, just to give a quick background, this was uh, the, you know, ultimate nerd was it's, it was a nopper from FERC. So it was a notice of proposed rulemaking mm. from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Basically, it was a plan by uh, Secretary Perry and the Trump administration to boost coal and the nuclear industry because of their uh, reliability and that th they wanted to create a new standard where sources of power that had 90 days of power available at all times would get a bonus, essentially, they'd get subsidized. And so the, the plan was, was sent over to FERC, which is an independent commission that for many months was paralyzed because it didn't have any members, but finally it got its full membership and they delayed the, the decision, but they finally came out with the decision in January and they basically said, no, you know, we don't need to do that. And that, uh, unfortunately for them on the timing, uh, for the administration, I mean, they had the cold snap in, in the Northeast and it really, the reliability really wasn't that much affected. In fact, one of the ones that went down was a nuclear plant in Massachusetts. So uh, it was kind of one of those things where it was a big expectation that it would boost coal and it would boost nuclear and it didn't happen. So now we have to sort of figure out where, where are they going to go next. They did say, well, we're going to have the uh, regional transmission operators look at that, look at reliability, look at resilience, and maybe we'll see what we can do. But I think it was kind of a, uh, an unexpected decision to basically, by Trump appointees, basically saying to the administration, no. And I, I was going to quickly say on the solar thing, I think that's another huge issue. That tariff is really, there's a lot of anger about that in terms of the solar installers. Um, and it's sort of ironic that the two companies that were, had filed that case, you know, and they're making the claim that they're U.S. manufacturers. They're in fact, both of them are subsidiaries of one from China and one from Germany. So it's an interesting uh, development. Uh, well, just one thing um, on, on the just on nuclear, what, what I find interesting is this kind of kind of quiet or maybe not so quiet push by the uranium industry who are like, I mean, right now uranium prices are not uh, anywhere near uh, where they want them to be to, you know, to for them to have any kind of a comeback. But, you know, we saw it was a pretty quiet announcement, I think, last week where two uranium companies uh, filed a petition with the Commerce Department basically asking the Commerce Department to investigate Russia, Kazakhstan, and Uzbekistan to see if there was unfair competition and to potentially uh, bar some imports from there to, to lift the industry. Um, and, you know, they're arguing this is a national security concern. Um, currently, I think this, this year, uh, domestic uranium is only expected to supply 3% of uh, U.S. nuclear power. Um, I don't know, there's a lot of interesting activity going on in that sector. Um, and then you have the Interior Department kind of putting an emphasis on critical minerals. So this is a, 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 a new area that's kind of sprouted up uh, to watch, um, I think, in the coming year. So I don't know what it means for, for, for nuclear power, but uh, it, you know, we haven't heard from these miners in, in a while and they're kind of trying to, to take advantage of this uh, uh, pro-mining administration. Okay, uh, more questions. I'll take uh, one, sir, in the jacket uh, in the back there, and then, uh, 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 sir, with the glasses in the back over there. Uh, I'm looking at you. Yeah, <laughs> in, in the red, please. Yep. Okay, excellent panel. This is Andrew Patterson from Environmental Business Journal. So the larger meta question is how are we as journalists getting out of our own echo chambers or eco chambers to get alternative perspectives? just on a, a practical basis, weekly basis, because we all missed the story of 2016, which was Trump's election. <laughs> Everybody missed it. We weren't talking to states. We weren't talking to fossil industry. We blew it. So we're actively talking more to industry now at our end. We're talking more to red state Democrats. So I would illustrate that as one of the stories that Pat was talking about, how which races are going to be affected in 2018. We're focusing on fossil state Democrats. 
and we don't think the environmental issue may break the right way on that. But there's 10 of those senators, and they're in fossil states. The second one is one that Valerie mentioned, which is there may be more push for our stories out of shareholder activism and trillion dollar management funds that were highlighted at Davos. Pat, I think Bloomberg covered the story with Larry Fink's letter in a couple of weeks ago <laughs> about societal contributions and what in active investors are going to do to enforce environmental goals. That's possibly going to be a bigger issue than anything that happens at EPA. Great. Thank you. And, and our, go ahead, sir. Can you stand, please? Name, name and question. Thank you. Michael Zorn, formerly at the Wilson Center, soon to be at Resources for the Future. I had a question to build on the SEJ um, a news alert for 2018 on public lands and public waters. I'm particularly interested in the panelists' perception on the political battles on monuments, on public lands in the American West, and on offshore marine environmental usage, wh where Secretary Zinke and Interior particularly, but other secretaries as well, have been strongly on the advocacy side for the industries, and there's a lot of very a strong advocacy from the nonprofit side and states on defending the public lands and waters. Thanks. Okay, so question of public lands and monuments, <laughs> and uh, uh, what are we not going to miss this time? <laughs> <laughs> so I can just the, I can... Um, yeah, go ahead, please. <coughs> it was interesting for me uh, coming to the States uh, a month before the election in 2016. <laughs> um, out there in uh, Southeast Asia and the rest of the world, really, I mean, we also missed it. This is also because um, a lot of the uh, mainstream newspapers and whatnot, uh, they essentially got their news from the New York Times and the Washington Post, right? And they didn't have people on the ground. When I came here, I, um, I very quickly became convinced that uh, Donald Trump is going to win for the simple reason that I found several things in common with places in Asia that I'd covered, many elections across several countries. One is politics, all politics is, is essentially local. I think we forgot that. If someone comes along and says, I'm going to make your life better, I'm going to give you roads, infrastructure that works, et cetera, et cetera, I'm going to get you jobs, of course you vote for him. Why not, right? You're not, in, you're not, you're not concerned with higher ideological issues like democracy in Burma, for example, you know, right? or climate change, which, as we know, is a slow-onset disaster, right? You don't see it coming. It's not going to kill you immediately. But if you're in a vulnerable zone and your, your town is sinking or something, yes, yes, of course. So again, so... All politics essentially is local and there's an emotional, of course it's multi-layered, there's also an emotional uh, quotient to it. So, which is uh, several factors at play, which is, you know, for another panel. But yeah, that, that is one of the uh, thoughts that struck me when I first came here. Hmm. Uh, I can uh, just speak to the, the public lands question. Um, I think what's interesting is our West is this kind of battle between, um, you know, what is what are the critical industries of the West? What what are what do people value there? And I, I think the political muscle that's been shown by the outdoor retail industry has been a very interesting story. And this kind of verbal battle between Patagonia CEO and uh, and uh, <coughs> Zink, uh, Interior Secretary Zinke and uh, Utah Congressman Rob Bishop. That's a very interesting fight. And and they're kind of in a way battling for the. <laughs> The soul of the West. What is you know? What are what are people? What do people more value? Is it preserving the pristine landscapes, or is it um, you know, as uh, Secretary Zinke would say, like multiple use of the land from everything from mining to grazing to ranching? Um, and I think that's a very interesting issue to watch. And I I am curious how that actually plays out during the election, uh, during the midterms, because there was a lot of public outcry and involvement uh, during this monuments review last year. So I think that will be interesting to watch. Also, and one more thing, and the, just have hearing uh, Secretary Zinke call the outdoor retailers and the outdoor conservation groups um, special interests is a very interesting <laughs> um, way of putting things. They're trying to uh, change, change the rhetoric, and, um, and I, I think that's also been very interesting to observe. And I guess in, in terms of the echo chamber, I think that's a huge issue and, and something I personally want to strive to do better on this year. Um, I learn so much more when I can talk to small business.
business owners who are outside the Beltway. I mean, they will take a chemical policy and have a completely different perspective on it that I never could have expected. For me, the challenge is that I live in and work in the Beltway and I get one trip a year, so I don't get to go out very often. And so what I've tried to do in some of my meetings with some of the trade associations that I work with is ask them, when you have some sort of members event in DC, invite me just so I can meet and talk to you know, your members. And so that's, that's one of the strategies I have. Um, and then when we do have our you know, once a year trip um, to tack on meetings there. Um, I had a trip in North Carolina which is, has um, a very huge furniture business. And I got to meet some of the furnishings companies, be they you know, sofa makers, rug makers, um, designers who were worried about chemicals. And it was fascinating the level of sophistication they had and how well they knew these policies that we were covering in Washington, but the challenges that they faced. And so, um, so I try and tack on something to my business trips. Um, oh, no, go ahead. I also, just talking about the echo chamber, a lot of the rhetoric is, you know, kind of industry versus the environment a lot of the time. And it's important to recognize there are industries that benefit from regulations. You know, if, if you are a supplier to an automaker and the fuel economy regulations get stricter and you have the technology to help the automaker get there, that's actually helpful for you. If you are um, someone who does stream bank restoration, you know, th that's why the housing development industry doesn't like a regulation like the clean water rule like quotas is because if they fill in a stream, they have to pay someone to restore a stream somewhere else. Um, so I think it is important to, to you know, show that there is a kind of a diversity within that world and just as there can be a diversity among, you know, what states think about these kinds of regulations. Yeah, I just will briefly say on the National Monument thing, I think the idea of the, of the push or the fight for the soul of the West is very much accurate and that there really is a big pushback from what the administration wanted to do. I mean, ultimately, they've only really made public two of the recommendations, which is for Bears Ears and for uh, the Grand Staircase Escalante. And you could argue that, in fact, that wasn't even because of Trump's great interest in the environment. It was because he wanted to court Orrin Hatch. He wanted Hatch to run for re-election again. And Hatch had been mad about the Grand Staircase thing for 20 years. They, if you talk to a Republican in Utah, they, you, you think that that happened yesterday. They're still mad about it because of the way that Bill Clinton did that. And I think even Obama's efforts were more inclusive in terms of getting all kinds of stakeholders to weigh in versus what was done in the 90s, partly to sort of counteract that. But that sort of didn't matter because of the politics was Orrin Hatch is mad. I want to help Orrin Hatch. I'm going to do this. Um, there's been – he's gone – Zinke has gone around the country and, in fact, made local stories out of I'm not going to – rescind your monument. And I'm going, you know, it, it was on the table. I put it on the table, and now I'm taking it off the table. It's kind of this weird, it was only in question because the administration put it in question, but then he took it off the table, and he gets a lot of good press out of it. Mm -hmm. So he knows how to do that. It, and just one, one more okay. point is, um, while, yes, there is a lot of greenwashing out there where companies try and sell their products or their services as somehow <coughs> environmentally beneficial when it may not measure up, there's an awful lot of sincere values marketing because companies are recognizing that millennials want to purchase something that they can believe in, be their value, um, an environmental value, a labor value, or, or, or some other value. And so I think there's um, a lot of interesting areas to cover in that, too. Yeah, Patagonia is counting on that. I mean, that they've made that a, an explicit part of their business model. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one question on this side. You, ma'am, here. And this side of the room. Uh, sir, in the middle here. Hi. Uh, so I'm Lisa Palmer. I'm a freelance journalist. Um, uh, you know, uh, environmental stories, as you were saying, you know, they are um, stories about law and policy and biodiversity and wildlife and, and energy and chemicals and, and, and politics. You know, these are complex stories. And I just wanted to get your sense on, on craft a little bit. I mean, are your publications giving you 
any kind of bandwidth to cover the complexity of some of these stories? Or how have you been able to address sort of some of the limitations that you have in, ha in having the constant parade of deadlines? You know, are, you know, what are ways you're packaging stories differently or whatever? So can you, hopefully you can address some of these, um, just some of the functions of, of your job and how you can get okay. the complexity. Journalism and craft and, and you, sir, please. Oh. Uh, yes, you. <laughs> Carl Brook with the Environmental Law Institute. I'm curious about the other side of the echo chamber. In the late 1960s, 70s, and 80s, most people got information from the major media outlets. You had Walter Cronkite and Brinkley and others s telling it how it was. And I think that was a large part of the broad public interest in clean water, in clean air. On the consumption side of the news, we have our own echo chambers. And so there's a great difference in public opinion on environmental issues. And I'm curious, how do we reach out to those particular echo chambers? How do we get these stories into these other forums to get more of a common understanding? I'll try to, <coughs> I hope, address a little bit of, of both of those. I mean, to your question about time management, uh, if you have any tips, I'm, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I'm exhausted. <laughs> like two little kids at home and 12-hour days. Uh, I think that's not uncommon in this room. Um, I don't have a good answer on that, other than I try to prioritize the stories that um, I think mean the most, and you do the ones that you have to do because they're news, and that's legitimate. Um, but kind of to, to that question and yours, I mean, the stories that matter the most to me and the way I most try to still tell stories with, you know, varying degrees of success is to somehow find a way to explain how the decisions being made in Washington affect actual people and to put a face on that, you know? Like, we all know that, but um, it's, it's so uh, difficult some days to get past just what's happening and, and to go to the other end of that line and, and figure out who does that affect. Um, so I think really, you know, we're not campaign reporters to the echo chamber question. Our highest mission is to be able to explain to people how they're being governed and by whom and how the decisions being made here and uh, affect their lives and how the money being spent here is being spent here. Um, for example, when Scott Pruitt started talking about uh, a specific super fun site in, in Missouri, I just went to see like, well, what did the people there, you know, and it turns out to be a much more complicated picture as things always do. We go to places and our stereotypes fall away. And so I just think that's how we can be of the most service and hopefully, you know, we can all relate to human stories. We, we, we do all live in our own echo chambers to some extent, but, but if you can bridge that gap of showing that there's an actual person affected or who has something at stake in any of these fights, I think that's the, f you've gone the first step in at least getting someone to listen. Um, so those are the stories I try to spend the most time on. Great, very much. Yeah, um, I must say that about 20 years ago when I was so sort of rabbiting on about wildlife and environmental stories, I got a lot of eye rolls in the office, uh, but it's improved a great deal. And uh, the way I pitch things now is um, I, I go for stories which have a human interest, strong human interest angle, um, a lot of money involved, and crime. <laughs> so for example, <laughs> just for example, um, wildlife crime okay. then, for example, right? Um, a lot of people are unaware, for example, of the, the teeth that the CITES convention has, that they have the power of sanctioning a country, um, trade sanctions or whatever, a range of sanctions. Uh, Laos, um, in fact, the State Department has identified Laos, Madagascar, and uh, Congo, DRC as uh, countries of uh, special focus or interest or something. And uh, in October 2018, in Sochi, the Society uh, Standing Committee, they'll be looking at these uh, cases. And Laos has to clean up. It has said, we're going to close down our tiger farms. They're breeding tigers like rabbits in Laos, right? Uh, they'll have to prove that they're doing it. Otherwise, they're going to be slapped with sanctions. Now, if a country is uh, targeted by sanctions, then it affects the region. It affects trade, it affects the country's reputation in international forums and all that. So all this is important. So I try and draw um, a bigger picture and bring in all these elements to, to, to show that it matters. Even then, of course, what, uh, when I'm, if it's solely wildlife, it has to be very dramatic. And it's normally one big story and then silence for a while, you know, until an excuse comes up to pitch it again. Great. 
Any I would I would just make a, a little bit of a pitch for the AP in, in answering this in terms of getting out of the echo chamber. You know, one of my uh, the fe unique features of my job is I am in contact with reporters all over the country literally every day. You know, sometimes I'm having literally 11 or 12 instant message conversations all over the country. So when I've written about the National Monuments, you know, I know our reporters in, in Salt Lake. There's two of them that have been doing a great job on that. And so when, you know, they make the big announcement, I will write the Washington story, and then we'll do what we call a PM, or which is the, the follow-up story. They'll take that same story and they'll flip it, and they'll write it from the local perspective with a local dateline. And they talk to me about what the policies are, but I talk, you know, to them about, you know, they're giving me their input. And, you know, on the uh, offshore drilling in Florida, I work with a reporter, you know, in Tallahassee. Um, you know, you can go on and on, you know, Dakota Access Pipeline in North Dakota. I mean, I literally, every state by state, I, I, I work with people in Flint, Michigan. I did a lot of Flint stories. I mean, probably more than any other of these other issues was, was the Flint thing because it was such a huge issue that for one period was really undercovered. I was really shocked at how little it was covered by the overall media at first. And then I think it, it created a big story, sort of like the gymnastics thing where there was some stories that were coming out, but they were not being done in the bigger papers. And, and you know, we were writing about it from Indiana and, and from Michigan, but not necessarily uh, was it going out all over the place. And I think that's one thing that we try to focus on because, you know, our papers are, you know, in, in Kansas, they're in Illinois, they're in every state, a lot of local papers, that's where we go. And so we always are keeping that in mind that that's who our readers are, not necessarily within the Beltway. Although, on the other hand, I'm, I'm at the Capitol, I'm in the Beltway, I'm in the hallway talking to senators. So, I mean, it's, you know, like on the shutdown, I talked to Steve Daines. And within like 30 seconds, who's a senator from Montana, within 30 seconds of our conversation about whether the shutdown will end or not, he started talking about Glacier National Park and how proud he was that it was open. And so that's just sort of how the conversations go. Great. Well, uh, sadly, we're out of time for this panel, so please join me in thanking our, our uh, reporters up here. Thanks very much. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to ask you all to stay for a minute while I invite Tom Lovejoy to come up and offer some closing remarks before we move to the dining room. Tom is a professor at the Department of Environmental Science and Policy at George Mason University and a senior fellow at the UN, UN Foundation for Science, Economics, and Environment based in Washington, D.C. Uh, he has served on science and environmental councils under the Reagan, Bush, and Clinton administrations and was the World Bank's chief biodiversity advisor uh, for environment for Latin America and the Caribbean. In the 80s, he has uh, brought an international attention to the world's rainforest, in particular the Brazilian Amazon, and he is an advisor to both my program and our Brazil Institute here at the Wilson Center. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. So, first of all, thank you for such an interesting afternoon. Uh, really been... Uh, Terrific. Uh, second of all, welcome to the land of the swamp. Right? <laughs> and we know that swamps are great things. Right? <laughs> uh, something that some of the others haven't figured out yet. Right? Uh, I just have a uh, couple comments. One is uh, listening to uh, the topic around toxic substances. Uh, I think that toxic substances are or constitute one of the really biggest environmental threats uh, down the line because uh, we may know something about what individual toxic substances do, but it's only a handful. We know virtually nothing about how they interact with each other. Uh, and I think we're seeing we're seeing symptoms of that chemical soup uh, in the decline of flying insects at night on uh, North America and Europe. Uh, it, it's got to be tied to all that kind of thing. Uh, and in that soup have to be some bad things for people too. Uh, I was really heartened by uh, what Ed Maybeck told us about the, the climate communication work and the weather casters. Uh, so that, that gives us a sense of how powerful, in fact, that environmental journalism 
uh, can be as a force for the good. Uh, and lastly, I'd just like to say, you know, thank goodness for the environmental journalists and for the society, a uh, collection of just incredible, bright, compelling, energetic, and committed people. So thank you very much. Thank you.